الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته حق تقاته ولا تموتون إلا وأنتم مسلمون وبعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله خير الحدي حب محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم شر ما يحدث وكل ما يحدث بدع وكل ما يحدث ضلال وكل ما يحدث Brothers and sisters, friends, guests, everyone, I uh, wish you the greeting of all of the prophets, the greeting of believers, the greeting of angels, the greeting of Jannah, the greeting of Allah Himself. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How many didn't understand the opening reality? Everyone else got it, yeah? No? Uh, in a nutshell, the opening beautiful way every single prophet ever said to mankind is how he would begin when he would speak about God, when he would bring about the subject of his Lord. When, just to give you a little background history, when Allah, when God told the angels to bring the earth so that he may create Adam, the angels questioned and they said, why? You know, it's like looking at something deficient. Because we were given something special, a test, free will. Whereas the angels, they were perfect, and everything God created was perfect. Everything He's created worships Him and praises Him and lives and exists perfect. So why do you want to create this thing that's going to shed blood and do horrible things? And some of those horrible things we can't even say. So why? And God said, you don't know what I know. So those mankind, when they come together, Allah says to us in the Quran, after he has created us, he then tells us that if you mention me, I will mention you. Actually, he says, just think of me and I will think of you. Mention me and I will mention you in a better gathering. And the saying continues, there's more to it. But that part where he says, mention me, I will mention you, the prophets emulated this. They took this and they would mention God wherever they could, whenever they could. And every time they mentioned God, um, this is quite interesting. The angels, they see these people, these men and women mention God. And when they do, it becomes quite exciting for them. I'll give you an example. How many of you have seen a YouTube video of a, of, a, of, a, of a man who doesn't have, he has really tiny hands in his shoulder and really tiny legs in his hips. So he's a really tiny man. He doesn't, he doesn't have long arms. He was born this way. Have you seen this video? Extremely inspirational video. Does anyone know his name? I forgot his name. I'm going to make it a point to memorize because he's important. He's special. <coughs> this guy does things I haven't done. And I'd probably be afraid to try some of those things he's done. So he's quite a phenomenal individual. His challenges didn't stop him from moving on and living life. So he's quite an amazing person. So when you see him, those who haven't seen him, you wouldn't know. But when you see something like that, you're like, wow, that's amazing. Well, a creation like us, who don't see God, who haven't seen him now while we're alive, we haven't seen him, we don't get to call upon him the way the angels do. We don't witness him the way they do. Yet still, that's why they asked, why did he create this thing? And here we are, without seeing him, without having met him in this life, we come together and we remember him. And this is the most favored task of the angels, because out of everything they can do, the one thing they love the most is being near their Lord, the one who created them. So they find it phenomenal, they find it amazing that these people who don't even see him, they come together to remember him. And thus the angels gather the surrounding and they protect it from any evil intrusions. And the more angels will continuously arrive as they see the light of the angels emulating. They know that these angels have gathered in this place. You know that feeling, you're walking down the street, and especially sisters, you walk down a mall and you see a bunch of women gathering in this court, you know there's a sale. And you want to hurry up and get over there, you know. But if a bunch of guys are rushing a different way, let's not talk about what they're running for. Never mind. <laughs> But you know what I mean. So other guys will rush towards that and they'll get excited. Well, Malaika, the angels, they see other angels, they know what's going on. Because they don't get excited by things we do. The thing that excites them is remembrance of Allah, of their Lord. 
So they know other angels have gathered, so they go rushing when they see this. They want to say, we want to be part of this. And what is it they want to be part of? That if the angels are amazed that these slaves of God, these people, have come together to remember him, then Allah will also be amazed. And the angels want to witness when Allah is happy. They want to be there when Allah is pleased and he is, and he then speaks about us by name, all of us. And the angels continuously come and they sit on top of one another all the way to the heavens where Allah speaks to them and says, who are these people? Why are they gathered? And the angels now are bashful because they questioned why create them. And now they know why. Because God says, why are they gathered? Oh, well, they are gathered to remember you, to praise you. Praise me. Have they seen me? I.e., you see me. You praise me. You question them. Have they seen me? No, Lord. What if they saw me? They would praise you far more. What else do they say? They are grateful to you. What are they grateful for? Matters of this worldly nature, which are the lowly of the lowest parts of creation. What are they grateful for? And so on and so forth. And, and what if they saw the heavens and the <coughs> more I could give them? They'd be far more grateful. What else do they say? They see you as great. Have they seen my powers and my abilities as the angels have? They know. What if they saw? They'd be so much more mesmerized and amazed by you. Now the angels more and more realize that beginning when they said why. Now they know why. And here they say, O oh Lord, give them the best reward you know. And Allah says, the best reward I can give them is I can forgive them. I.e., whatever you've done gives you another chance. Overcome your burdens and start fresh. In a nutshell, this beginning Arabic, when you hear it, that's what's happening. And what's actually being said is Allah is not in need of this, but rather it is us who need to praise Him and ask Him for help, nasta'inuhu, and ask Him to forgive us when we forget to ask Him for help, nasta'afiru, and seek refuge from, in Him from the evils of our own deeds, the even, evils of ourselves and the wickedness of our own deeds. And whoever does this, then God guides them, no one can misguide them. But whoever tries to live life from their own accord and think they know better, they'll find themselves bickering and bashing their head into a brick wall, and no one can guide such people. I bear witness there's no deity worthy of worship except one God, Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad indeed was his final messenger. This is the, in a nutshell what has been said, and a bit more. The only other part I'll translate to you is his command or his right over you and I. He says, you believe in me. You believe I exist. People who are not Muslim even, you will ask them, do you believe in God? They will say, I believe there is something. So they believe. Allah is speaking to anyone who believes there is something. Something. I'm going to be uh, quite brief because there's so many stories. I'm going to try to be brief and it's still going to take a while. Sorry. But I'm going to try to be brief about the stories because they're quite long. But I just want to share examples with you. This thing about <coughs> how he was a mercy unto mankind, this thing was one of the many paths that the students of knowledge took. When they were studying, they would study many paths. And amongst the different ways of education, amongst the different paths of life, of all types of sciences, this path of studying the Prophet Muhammad became the most popular. Because in everything in life, Every situation, there was wisdom and guidance in his example. So this became synonymous with the word path. So when you say, I am on a path, it means you are studying the life of Muhammad. Sirah. So this is a very lengthy subject. So I'm just going to give examples. Examples are the best ways. Otherwise, if we break down formulas, it will take us ages. So just to give some examples of uh, this man being a mercy unto mankind. Uh, let's set the um, let's uh, let's do this storytelling style. And let's kind of take ourselves back there. Remember the city of Mecca, how it was. So try to visualize a group of mountains, hot desert, and it, it, it's it's uh, it's a small valley. And here is a man who, as a all his life, he's lived as a very innocent child, very soft-spoken person. Um, and he's someone that everyone fell in love with, as in his friends loved him as the best of friends. 
and acquaintances saw him as the most noble person. Anyone who met him had only good to say of him. And this is the kind of thing we always hear about him when we study Sila. When you ask people about Muhammad and what people thought of him, he was known. In fact, they had a nickname for him. I mean, if we go around the room and start talking, asking each other, what's, what's your best friend's nickname for you? What does he call you? It's rarely nice. You know, and you say, what do people call you? What's your, what's your nickname? I, a polite one that's not really a swear word, you know. In America, people say, oh, uh, some friends, they call me Boom Boom. <laughs> or, or Boo. Or, or, I don't know. Sorry? Are you okay? Yeah, sure. There's lots of examples, you know. There's lots of things people say to each other. And, you know, they have nicknames for each other. They call each other dog and, and other things like that. But what was Muhammad called? Um, in a city where Muhammad himself, his name was not a common name, and his birth and the family he was from was not a usual family. He was from Hashim, who was in charge of the well of Samsung. So the family were responsible for providing the drinking water for any pilgrim that ever came to the area. So they were always known as nobles. And here is this noble man, this young man at the time, who all the people in Mecca only said good of. And what was his nickname? His nickname at that time, which he had more nicknames later in life, his nickname at that time was special. It's Alamin. And this isn't an ordinary nickname. Because you can say nice things about people, and you can give them sweet nicknames. But this nickname wasn't usual. They called him trustworthy. About everything they knew, this guy, he is going to be honest, upfront, simple, and you can trust him. To the point where the parliament of that time, the Qurayshis, the idolaters that ran Mecca, and they were in charge of the holy house, and they were in charge of the, of the pilgrims that were coming, and they were rich and wealthy. The four main tribes, they were rebuilding the Kaaba. They had taken some damage from a flood, and they were rebuilding it. And uh, one of the rules they made when they were rebuilding it, they said, because it's a holy shrine, we won't, um, we won't use any impure money. Because everyone was challenging, I will rebuild it. I'll do it myself. I'll pay for it. No one else, just me. They were very wealthy. They wanted the honor that my family built it. So everyone was competing. So they came up with a rule and they said, well, fine, but whatever money we put forward, we have to make an oath that it only be um, clean money, pure money, earned from a pure source. So they themselves, these wealthy men, came up with this rule, and it's about God. So even, even an alcoholic in his heart is in love with God, or a fornicator, or a murderer, or whatever. They don't challenge God. In their hearts, if they believe, they have a shyness, they have a superstition. The worst of sinners are superstitious, worried about bad omens, bad luck. So they were worried about bad omens. So they wouldn't mess around with God, even though they messed each other over all the time. So they said, we'll keep only pure money. And these are the richest of them. And they came forward with all the money. And you know what? It wasn't enough to rebuild the Kaaba. All, all of the wealthy people, all of them chipped in the purest bits of money they could find in their accounts, in their possessions. And it wasn't enough to rebuild the whole Kaaba. That's why today you can see the Kaaba and you see a black box, a black house, square. And then you see a white pillar that goes right on the end of it, like a little U-shape. That area used to be part of the Kaaba. But when it was damaged and they were rebuilding it, they couldn't make it all the way. They didn't have enough clean, pure money to rebuild the whole thing. So they said, we'll just mark this area. That's how illegitimate and corrupt the society was. And today, it's not very different. If you just tell people, bring some clean money forward. If you study interest alone, the evils of interest, then none of us would have any clean money. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said a time will come where the dust of interest will land on the feet of every single person, i.e. the coins you carry in your pocket. Because it holds no real value, it's just money, it's automatically interest, it's a riba. So there's many other things like this. They had no halal source at the time, very little halal money, and it didn't complete. But when they did finish whatever they built, they had to pick up this special stone known as the black stone and they believed that it had fallen out of the heavens and they wanted to put it back in the corner where it was, uh, where it originally was put, 
And the Ottawa Four tribes they begin arguing who will put this stone back, who will build this, etc. Kind of like how they were competing in, 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 in the world over who will host the Olympics, who will build the next stadium. It's about business, money, and honor. It's about your name, promotion. So they were like, who will put this stone back? It will be said, it will be known, and it will be remembered. And so they were so adamant, they got to the point where they were pulling swords. And that's how the Arabs were. They're quite hot headed. They're ready to fight and kill over anything. And uh, so one of them said, let us not fight over this. The next man that comes through the, the door of the holy mosque, the sacred mosque, will ask him, which tribe should put it in? And this became a big problem because they were about to have bloodshed. And what they actually did was the next person who picks, who comes in and picks one, then the other three are going to want to kill him for it. So someone's going to die. It may as well just be whoever the poor soul is that walks in. And let's just pick whoever comes in. So this was a trap for whoever walked in. And the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, this is a guess of course because of their nature. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him walked in and immediately all of them rejoiced. They said it's Alami. And all of them were stone to the sacred mosque, and then the Prophet reached underneath and lifted the stone up into place. So it was written that this man did this act. This is a big thing, it's not a small thing. There was something special about this man. But the other side of the coin, that the rest of the examples I'm going to give you are not going to be just stories of who he was or what he did. Rather, what made him that kind of a person. Why did people call him Alami? Why did people love him so much? Why did people trust him so much that he was elevated at such a young age? What was it about him from even infancy when he was young, five, six years old, or four or five years old, he used to sit next to his grandfather at the Kaaba? Or like today you would say, today you could say, um, you know in the parliament you have all those chairs and there's one at the top, what's his name? Speaker. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Right, so Mr. Speaker, I'm assuming Mr. Speaker has a grandson. He probably does. Could you imagine one day a party with Mr. Speaker bringing his grandson along and sitting next to him while everyone is having their debates? That's exactly what happened. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the young boy, used to sit up there from a very early age. There was something about him, there was something he did that continuously made people like him. Going even further back to when he was first born, after about five, six months as an infant, the Bedouins they used to, the, the Arabs they used to send their newborns out with the Bedouins, with wet nurses, so that they could get out of the smog and the pollution of the city, and they could it, it, they could grow in fresh air, but also the the purest of the Arabic language and grow strong and be, you know live on harsh terrain and not be a soft person who would easily be harmed, etc. So they would all do this, and this cost money. And one of the one of the families of the wet nurses, again, even she when she was leaving, she didn't get to take any family because no one could afford, no one could pay. A lot of them got children, but she didn't. And as they were leaving, there was something so special about him that when they looked upon him, her own husband said, "Let's at least take him. There may be blessings from this man." And that's another story later. If I have time, I'll come back to and tell you what kind of blessings just this tribe outside of Mecca received from just having this child. Now let's talk about why people love him so much. The other side of this. And I'd like to reflect myself first and foremost, and for my Muslim brothers and sisters here, to reflect on the statement of the Prophet Muhammad when he said, the best form of da'wah is example. Is being the example. That doesn't mean you sit someone down and say, all right, George, come sit down and talk to you about God. It's not going to work. You go next door, not by my neighbor's door, and say, I've been wanting to talk to you about religion. They're going to slam the door shut in the face. But it's not, it's not evangelical. It's not about go put your religion down people's throats. It's not about telling people. It's about showing. So when people say things to you and say, well, you didn't have to do that, you explain, this is what my prophet did. Well, you didn't have to be that kind. You didn't have to be like this. Or you didn't have to be like that. And, and people get surprised by it. Lauren Booth came to one of our dinners. She's the Prime Minister's like, um, sister-in-law, I believe, right? Yes. Oh, former Prime Minister, thank you. I thought you were going to say former sister-in-law. No, former Prime Minister, yes. Um, she, you keep it, you found it. She said, the person who found it might come back. So you should hold this. Said, she was a good example. And he said to her, you keep it. If the person comes back, I'll pay you. 
This is a reward for you for being such an honest person. Being an example, just, just, just that is the best form of sharing the essence of what was taught by this man. And that is what he did all his life. He was an example. And that's why I'm going to share a few examples as to why people liked him so much and why we should emulate this kind of nature. Why people thought this guy is so amazing. Rasulullah So let's start with the first example. There's many. There's many. I'll try to get to as many as I can. Okay, why people loved him so much and why they found him so special. We start from the beginning when he first started, you know, feeling spiritual. Okay, he had a, a strange upbringing. He, he didn't have a father. His father had died. His, uh, his mother died when he was a very young. He was one of the Quraysh of that tribe. So when they saw him, and the Quraysh had disowned this man. And everyone knew that because he said he's a prophet. So now the people of Taif see an opportunity. Let's take our anger out on them. Let's get this man so good that the Quraysh will wish they could stand up and defend their own. But they can't because they disowned him. It will burn their skin. So they took their anger out. And for 10 days, Muhammad went to fight. And the last three were the worst. They let the children loose. They threw the stones. And they pelted and they insulted hour upon hour, minute upon minute, for three days straight until Muhammad gave up and ran out of the city and landed near a tree in a piece of land that some of his cousins owned. And he sat there. <coughs> they hurt this man so bad. This man is called Alami. They hurt him so bad that when he sat down, the narration says he had to peel the sandal off of his foot because the blood had dripped down his body and dried in his sandal. So the love of Alami was And at this point in time, after all of that, he made a prayer. Never complained. Finally he complained. All of these things happened. He never once complained to his Lord. This time he complained. This was bad. In fact, later, in, when Muslims were in Medina and they were better off and they were in the Battle of Uhud, it was the, one of the worst battles ever. In the Battle of Uhud in Islam, seven. In the Battle of Uhud, 70 of his closest companions <coughs> were killed in a worse way possible. And his uncle was mutilated, someone very dear to him, Hamza, who protected him. He was mutilated and horribly in battle. And so this really hurt the Prophet. And Aisha wept, and everyone wept, and the Prophet wept. And he was so sad. He said, Aisha, his wife said to him, um, this was a new wife, long after Khadija had died. He said to, she said to him, have we seen a day worse than Uhud? It's so bad. This is so bad. Is this the worst day in our history? He said, no. Remember 70 slaves? He said, no. Taif. That day he left Mecca and went to Taif for three days. Those three days of abuse. He said, that was worse than Uhud. It was that bad. And on that day he sat on a plane and finally complained to his Lord. So it's that bad. He's in that much pain, physical and heartbroken. His wife's dead, his uncle's dead. So much torture. So finally he said to his Lord, what is his complaint? This is a beautiful lesson to believers, to true believers. Now he's complaining to his Lord to say, why this or why not? What's his complaint? He says to his Lord, there must be something wrong in me. I've done something wrong. Why have you given me to these people? What kind of people have you given me to? Is it because I have displeased you? Is it something in me? If there is nothing wrong I've done, and you're not angry, meaning is this your anger? Have you punished me? Are you upset? If you're not upset with me, and this is just how it was supposed to be, then there is no complaint here. And I will remain <coughs> grateful to you. But if you're upset with me, then show me so I can make it right. His complaint was about himself that I could have done something different. A young boy, some of his cousins saw what the Taif people did, they couldn't do anything about it. So they told a servant boy who was Iraqi, from Naj, who was a Christian boy. They said to this boy, go take him some grapes to relieve him some comfort. Because they really felt bad what happened. They saw 
But they said, don't talk to him, because his words will be with you. So the boy went, he's a servant, brings the grapes. Mahan, peace be upon him, takes the grapes. And now he sees the comfort arrive. He made the prayer, he supplicated, and he took the grape, and before he ate, he said, in the name of God. What do Christians say before they eat? Arab Christians. What do they say before they eat? Bismillah. Bismillah. What do Jewish Christians, I'm oh, sorry, Jewish Christians, interesting. <laughs> what do Jewish Arabs say before they eat? Bismillah. What do they say when they want to thank Allah? All of them, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. What do they say? Arabs. Alhamdulillah. These are, these are the ways of praising Allah. So this young boy who was a Christian heard him say, Bismillah. He was not supposed to talk, but he just he shocked. He said, I work with your people for Asia, all your tribe. They don't say Bismillah. They don't talk like you. Where did you learn this? And Muhammad smiles and says, where are you from? Realizing he's a foreigner. He said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Najd. He said, ah, the land of my brother. Uh, the land of Yunus, Jonah in the Bible. You know of Jonah? Yes, I did. Jonah was my brother. He was a prophet. And all prophets are brothers. And the boy realized that this is a prophet of God. He kissed his head and he took his shahad. He became a believer there and then that this is definitely the messenger of God. Prophecy in the, in the scriptures of, uh, of the Bible that the boy knew. Having said that, the prophet saw a sign. This boy and Jonah, Eunice, his brother. In the prophet, Jonah was an example. What did Jonah do? He became frustrated with his people. He gave up on them to find new people to guide. And this was not the command of Allah. This, God did not tell Jonah to go, and he went. So he was punished, he, he, went, he was taken off the ship, he was swallowed by the whale. For three days, he suffered. And repeatedly in the belly of the whale, Jonah too blamed himself and complained. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka. There is no deity worthy of worship but you. All praiseworthy in the kuntum in the body. I am amongst the wrongdoers. I've done something wrong. This is the reality of prophets. They don't say to God, why me? Why have you done this? They say to the prophet, I've done something. They say to God, I've done something wrong. Otherwise, God is only merciful. So finally, he realized, like Jonah, he left the people without God's permission. That was a mistake. The prophet left Mecca without God's permission. And that was a mistake. God did not say go to Taif. Muhammad on his own accord thought, let me go here. So Muhammad realized and accepted the lesson and returned to the valley and returned to Mecca. It was a big lesson to him. Everything he went through. But before he come out of life, he just peeled the blood off of his foot. He is in agony. This is horrible what's happened to him. Everyone is shocked. Even his arch enemy sends him grapes because they feel so bad of what's happened to him. So the angel of the mountains come forward with permission from God. They are angry what they have done to Muhammad. And the angel says, Muhammad, give just one sign. I will take this mountain and that mountain and crush the people of life. Later in the battle of Uhud, the angel called and the enemy struck the prophet and his blood was dripping. And when his blood was dripping as he was being carried off the battlefield, he was panicking, lifting his blood. In another battle, it was the same. When the, when the idolaters attacked, and as a mercy unto mankind, I am not sent as a calamity upon them. The people that did so much, so you just try. To understand what he endured. And people today, youngsters especially, someone harms you, you get angry, you want to get back at them. Look at his example. Endure and be patient. And he said to them, the angels, they, maybe from them will come pious progeny. When Muhammad was burying his son, you know how special your baby is? His son died and he buried him. And he's looking at his grave. He's feeling the pains of a father. The, uh, the idolaters come and they say, oh, look, he is Aptar. In Arabic, this means one whose tail or lineage is cut off. As an insult, oh, look, you lost him. It hurt so bad that they insulted him at his son's grave. That Allah revealed verses. 
Allah revealed verses to him very thin to first comfort him out of love. He said, Inna atayyaka kawtha. Have I not promised you the best of paradise? Why are you feeling hurt? Why are you feeling sad? Have I not promised you paradise? So he was in pain. God comforted him. He didn't turn to people and complain. God said, have I not promised you paradise? He's like, okay, yeah, actually. I know where I'm going. This isn't so bad. Then he said, now continue with guidance. Now pray, I worship, and sacrifice. Continue to do good work. And then Allah insulted them back. Like Allah revealed verse and insulted his uncle back, that his hands perished, and he did. And then to the other people who called him up there, he said, they are the ones who were lineages cut off. And then so on and so forth. I'll give you a few more examples in a minute of how Allah, God himself, comforted him. There's no man to comfort that level of pain. No man to comfort that level. You can't say it'll be all right. It's just not enough. That level of pain, you need comfort from the Almighty. So here in Taif, the angels were ready to destroy them. And he says, maybe from them will come a lineage who will be pious and righteous. The reason why I went to that level and come back to Taif, I wanted to tell you, Allah said in Mecca, about them, their lineage will be cut. And about the people of Taif, Muhammad said, maybe from them will come pious people. Do you know today, presently, there is not one sign or shred of the Qurayshis existing in Mecca. They are gone. The Qurayshis, the idolaters, I mean. There is not one sign of them. So whose lineage was cut? Muhammad's or theirs? See, we shoot, we insult, we might miss. But when God shoots, he doesn't miss. He said, they are Akka. And they became Akka. Their lineage was cut. They were finished. They are no more. And the Prophet's lineage continues. And in Taif to this day, the biggest and best of scholars are from the city of Taif. The prayer he made for them. And in the battle of Uhud, his blood is dripping. He's panicking, lifting, saving his blood. And they say, why are you panicked? Let us get you off the field. He said, this is the blood of a prophet. If it hits the earth, I fear God's wrath will fall and destroy these people. And he raised his hand and he said, oh Allah, forgive them, they don't know. Forgive them, they don't know. And he continued with this kind of merciful attitude all his life. He was so kind to people. His neighbors were Jews and Christians. His kindness to people around him, they were witness to how amazing he was. Here's an example. A young boy next door is dying. He is ill. He is on his deathbed. Muhammad cares about souls. He goes next door and he visits this Jewish man and his son, this Jewish boy who is dying. And he says to the boy, you are dying. You are ill. Now declare God is one and I am your messenger. Imagine going to someone's house whose son is about to die, and you tell them to change their religion. Could you do that? No way. That would cause such a problem, unless you had that kind of relationship. What kind? That the boy did not respond. He didn't get upset. Instead, he smiled and looked at his father. Like, what do I do? And his father said, Obey Abu Qasim. He didn't call him by his name. He called him the father of Qasim the father of his son that passed away. He respected him with a nickname. He said, obey your uncle, Abu Qasim. And the boy took his declaration. Allah is one, you are his messenger. And then soon after he died, and the prophet exclaimed, Alhamdulillah, Allah saved his soul. What kind of relationship did he have with his neighbor that he was able to do something like that? What kind of a man was he that the, the Jewish man loved him so much and he trusted him so much that he said, son, obey. That is a drastic change. Today, but especially back then, even more. The examples are many. So I'm going to finish with just a couple of small examples, simple ones. How he was immersed into everywhere. See, I'm going to continue to the world. His message, his sacrifice. He didn't go after money. He didn't go after wealth. His own daughter, when she was older and had children, came to him and said, look, father, this, this, these business deals you've done has brought some money to the, to the Muslims. We've got wealth. We're a little bit better. My fingers are blistered. We've had a few rough years. Can maybe I can get a servant to help me out a bit? And the Prophet became upset and came back to her and said, do you really want help? She said, yes. And he said, say these things. And he taught her remembrances of Allah. SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar. Say these things and Allah will suffice for you. But the worldly things, me and my family, we have nothing to do with. 
On another occasion, the companion saw Mark so on his side, and he wept. He said, oh, messenger of God, at least you should sleep comfortably. Why are you suffering? He said, this world, what do I want with it? This world is here for you. Use it for good so you may earn the next life. I have no desire for these things. While he was a king and a ruler, he could have been very wealthy. He chose not to be. He could have been powerful and he could have killed his enemies. He chose forgiveness instead. When his enemies wanted to kill him, he, for, he would pray and say, Oh, Allah, forgive them, they don't know. And when he took them prisoner, when he was in a position to finally fight back, he says, No, enough is enough. You will not persecute these Muslims, these believers. Even then, he would forgive and he would be merciful and he would ransom. And he would say, If you can teach people how to read and write, I will free you. Even then, he was continuously, consistently merciful towards everyone. But it wasn't just to the public, to the world, that he was merciful. And, uh, you know, an old man, look at his humility. This is the leader, you would think. How do leaders behave today? SubhanAllah. You know? Anyway, so how he behaved. An old man came to him, trying to talk to him. And he's busy talking to the delegates of Mecca. And this old man keeps asking, you're, back, you're the prophet of God. Does God say such and such? And he gave him the answer, he walked away. Comes back, oh, another thing. Does God like such and such? And the prophet became a bit irritated because he's trying to speak to these delegates. So he shrugged and turned away. And Allah revealed the chapter in the Quran. He frowned and he turned away. Maybe you want guidance for these people, but maybe they're not, they're not interested in guidance. But maybe this man would have benefited from you. You don't pick who to guide. You don't pick who. You should be humble to everyone and whoever needs of you, you should be available to them. So forever after that, every time he saw this old man, he would say, he nicknamed him, he gave him an Arabic nickname. So whenever he saw the old man, he said to him, Oh, the one for whom which my Lord rebuked me, told me off. How was your day today? The next time he saw him, oh, the one for whom my Lord rebuked me. He him like a fried egg. The sound that they put him on. They saw his wound. They said, did it hurt? He said, yes, but, and the rock fell on you. Did it hurt? He said, yes, but, but how did you tend to that pain? He said, every time they said, say the idol is your God. And the ch my chest was caving in. I almost said, hope is my God. I wanted to just give in. And then just as I wanted to, just being able to say, Allah is one, Ahad, Ahad. The sweetness of that overcame the pain I was going through. The things they did to these pious people, the way they tortured them, now all those people are coming back to Mecca and they're coming in force. By the tens of thousands, all around. What did the idolaters do? Bear arms, get ready. They panic, they say, there is no fight left in us. God help these people. We had outnumbered them every time, but we couldn't destroy them. So finally, the prophet is riding his mule and is coming into the city of Mecca. This is the example. Now just imagine how petrified and scared the people of Mecca are. Because most of them have been told lies about the Muslim. They've been told lies that they like eat you alive or something. Or they got rocks that they got bombs strapped to them, every one of them. You know, that's the kind of lies you hear today about Muslims. And so these lies were spread in Mecca about the Muslims. So they're coming by the thousands in force. And when he comes, how does he come? This is the most beautiful sight in history. SubhanAllah. This king, this leader, is on his wheel and he's riding. How do kings ride today? How do they enter other countries and conquer? How do conquerors show off their power today all over the news everywhere? How do they show their might? He came on his mule and he looked and he saw the city of Mecca and he lowered his head. He got closer and closer, his head lowered more and more. And he felt the might of his believers. He felt it and he lowered his head. He says, this is no might because we were nothing and we outdone a whale of might. So that was always God. It was his will, it was not us. He lowers his head so much, he lowers it to avoid the arrogance of thinking, we did this. And his head hit the neck of the mule, the description says. The companion saw his neck is like this. And he rides into the city like that, like in shame, hum humility, humbleness. And he is weeping 
This is this is you, God. This is Allah. This is not us. No haughtiness. No arrogance. That's not what we were after. We don't want land. It's not about money. It's about justice. It's about mercy. It's about guidance. And when he was entering the city, they heard one of them, the angry Arabs. They remembered all the things these people did, and they were petrified. They were hiding in their houses. They remembered what they did to my sister, to the prophet's daughter, to so-and-so. They said, 